Um, first and foremost, and I'll get to Jack McLean a little bit through the slideshow, but one of the things he asked about, why would the state even put on Jack McLean Park if it didn't have connection to the Tomlin Tower? Because he brought up a little statements. I'm not going to hide what we've got and what we don't have. He brought up an opening statement, so we put it on. And we showed you what happened at Jack McLean Park. And it wasn't like law enforcement went out there and just kind of willy nilly this stuff. They processed it. Like they're supposed to. He brings up UPC codes. It'll tell you it came from Walmart. It doesn't tell you which Walmart. I remember it just came also from Tampa. All we know is that those were bought from Walmart. UPC codes don't tell you when they are, what time they are, where you can go back and get video. They simply say bought from Walmart. That's why you can buy a Walmart at the one in Crawfordville, turn around and, uh, and exchange that for one on uh, the north side of Tampa. That's what UPC codes are. They tell you the price tag. They tell you where it was bought, what time it was bought, over the mail, but that will allow you to go back and get video of all this stuff. We didn't even know that that stuff's related to this crime. We know it found in Jack McLean Park within a week of the homicide. But remember, this is a week later on a public area. So there's no blood on the shirt. Or that we need to test anything for the blood on the shirt. I, 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 Andy Pressey Williams said that she tested multiple spots on it. It was not blood. Looked like blood. Was not blood. So no further testing was done. Again, no connection to the crime other than the fact that the proximity within a week, but they actually tested it. Looked like blood, tested it for blood. Maybe there is something here. Oh wait, it's not blood. No, there's not. Gloves. Gloves were shown off to FDA. They were tested. We heard from Joe Brown talk about the testing of the, blood, of the glove. Again, Jack the Clean Park, out in the open for a week. No evidence at all. Makes issue about the things that weren't, that were found in the toilet. For those to be part of this crime, that means nobody flushed that toilet for a week. Public park, that makes any sense. So they just ignored it. Why did they ignore it? Investigator Lewis knew from his experience in dealing with stuff that every single day they go out there and clean these parks. So his experience was, this probably wasn't anything that had to do with the homicide, but we're going to collect the stuff anyway, run some checks just to see. Blood stains came back negative. The blood on the gloves came back negative. To know for a test were done. Again, there's nothing linking this to the homicide in any way, shape, or form. He has to talk about the bleach. Again, even Mr. Knox, defense witness, says there's no evidence that this crime was cleaned up. There's no evidence of any cleaning aspects in any way, shape, or form. So, what's the deal with bleach? Again, it's not related to the crime. Big deal was made about DNA. Mr. Segura's DNA is not there. Mr. Segura was there. There's not a doubt in anybody's mind at this point that he was there. Let's talk about this Santos Mexican cartel connection that the defense is trying to make. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mexican cartel are not going to come to the United States to kill Brandon on the south side of town, stop at Ace Hardware and buy a shovel, put a little dirt on the shovel, then drop it in her house and allow for the wig to be laid on top of it to show that it was there first and foremost. The Mexican cartel is not going to utilize a 32 caliber revolver gun, one gun only, if this is a group of Mexican cartel people. They're not going to have one gun that is a 32 caliber revolver that they have to repeatedly reload in order to utilize this thing with the wrong ammunition. If it's a group of Mexican cartel, how does she get out the front door? 
because they would have stopped her before they got out. There's this group of them sitting there, they stopped her. That defies common sense, logic, along the way. And it's in complete contrast to the two confessions. C.C. was afraid of Santos in his letter. The guy's locked up in prison. What C.C. says about fear is irrelevant. The question is what Brandy is afraid of. Well, Brandy is so afraid of this situation, she's allowing her kids to play out in the street. Remember, Ultron comes home, kids playing in the street. They're playing out there, eating the Burger King and everything like that. You've got all the other testimony, including Mr. Segura, that the kids were playing outside. So she's so afraid of this that she's allowing the kids just to run the neighborhood and no place them at. Doesn't make sense. Tyra Wilcox. It doesn't make sense that he would ask her for a gun if he had if he had one. Yes, it does. He had a gun. He did not want to utilize his gun. So he asked for another gun. She said no, and he didn't have another gun to use. So he had to use his own gun. And then he got rid of it. Maybe he got rid of it on the way down to Sopchoppy, across the Sopchoppy River. And he went to the woods on the way down there. I don't know. But again, you go back and you compare that to the other testimony in the case, and the confession to Mr. Kennard, who says that he asked for a gun from a girlfriend and she said no. Again, no way Kennard knows that. That wasn't even in the news. But he knows that tidbit, which happens to corroborate what Ms. Wilcoxon says. about the fact that he's already been paying child support and he paid small amounts. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't just one. Now his child support has doubled. He couldn't make the child support earlier. Now it's doubled. Now he's got more. Now he's got to pay for a child he doesn't believe is his. The amount of money we're talking about adds up to $160,000 until that child and just the age of 18. On a child that he doesn't believe is his. In addition to what he's already got for a child he knows is his. Remember, they notice that, that little girl that we saw the text messages from? That's his child and he knows it. That's not the case with Yvonne He says, didn't kill to make it. To make it doesn't live here. He's from life. Again, he knows that kid is his. Not the same with the father. A different kid. Said that there's undisputed evidence that the injuries were caused by something other than a gun. That may be true if you completely ignore the testimony about Flanagan, who was the medical examiner that actually looked at the wounds specifically. She was the one that performed the autopsy. She's the one that shaved the head to actually look at them. She looked at photographs. She looked at the person. And she said, this looks like it could have been caused by a gun. The rounded ones in the barrel, the big one right here by the butt of the gun being swung. And even went so far as one of them looks like the hammer. Undisputed? Absolutely not. The medical examiner that looked at it said one instrument consistent with the gun.
Let's go through and talk about some other stuff real quick. Talk about Paramore and Griffin making allegations that the state didn't follow up and on any of it. First and foremost, let's talk about Gregory Washington. Gregory Washington is an interesting individual. Um, Gregory Washington, at the time that he comes forth with this statement regarding Paramore, is facing a five-year imprisonment. That's his offer at the time. He's repeatedly calling the state attorney's office, as you heard, trying to work a deal for him. And his phone privileges were actually cut off where he couldn't. So Mr. Washington has to then say, I need to come up with something good. And he does. So what he comes up with at that point is, my cousin not think of this. Did he have a motive at that time? Yes. But the motive at that time to come up with that is, in fact, he needs to get a deal. So then they wire him up. Four calls, or four times, they go out there, and not once it was their confession. The closest thing they got was Mr. Paramore said that the kids had to die because of witness issues. I'm going to use those terms, obviously. But that was essentially what was said. Where's the confession? There wasn't one. But then, here we are coming back in here, and Mr. Washington wasn't called by the state, but called by defense. No incentive in any way, shape, or form at this point for him to do this testimony in any way. He's not being offered a deal. We haven't even had a conversation. He's a defense witness. And he comes in and says, Mr. Paramore, uh, Mr. Segura tells him. Said if Paramore wants to take fall for him, great. And get away with murder. Now, Investigator Basio is the one that goes in and takes this original information as it relates to Paramore. They would have you believe they did nothing regarding this. But that's not what Investigator Basio said. One, never been on the recording. Looked at Paramore. He used investigative tools. He eliminated via the cell phones. Remember they ran the, uh, the 264 prefix? Um, and they compared it against Griffin's phone numbers to find out where they were and things along those lines and eliminated them through that. He knew his DNA was in an investigative database, so he didn't run. Simple as that. He knew it was already there. But in 2016, they didn't run him anyway. Same results. Only one thing was tested because only one thing was interpretable. And we've heard the definition of interpretable versus non interpretable DNA. In addition to that, he still utilized those same interview skills that were used by Investigator Lewis and brought us here today with the interview with Mr. Segura. And took all of that into account, and there is nothing linking Mr. Paramore to this crime. Nothing. And that would be contrary to the confession of Mr. Paramore. Next, let's talk about Mr. Knopfinger. Mr. Knopfinger is a DNA expert for the defense. Joel and Brown told you about the importance of blind testing, ensuring impartiality and the danger of finding what you're looking for. Ironically, Kevin Knopfinger called it prosecutorial bias. Let's go side part. testimony and the or to the confession that he gave with Gregory Washington and to uh, Mr. Kennard. So let's go back and actually look at Kevin Knopfler's testimony. Only works if there are more than two donors. Kill them around. Assuming two donors.
Mr. Doctor, I found no evidence of three donors. If you have a third donor, you would expect to see a fifth key. Ladies and gentlemen, you can use your skills, your knowledge, your intelligence, what you learned through the course of the trial. No fifth key. Anywhere. No signs anywhere of that fifth key that will lead to a third donor. We're talking about two donors. Mr. Print brought up all of those alleles regarding Mr. Avila's DNA. And he attempts to explain it away because Mr. Avila does not have that 14. And he attempts to explain it away just like Mr. Noppinger did that that's because it's from the little girls. Well, if it's from the little girls, we're more than two done. Because we know Brandy Peters did this. And there's no signs at all of a third donor, and it just doesn't work. And then we have Dr. Kevin McElfresh. Dr. McElfresh this is a man that's been doing this for 30 years, and he now teaches at FIU. Dr. McElfresh was on the team that identified the remains from the September 11th uh, tragedy that happened in New York City. Dr. McElfresh was the man that was, uh, I helped identify the tomb of the unknown soldier uh, who is now known as St. Petersburg. Dr. McElfresh is the person that actually developed, and was on the team that developed a lot of the modern day DNA stuff that we do today. And Dr. McElfresh says, no evidence of third donor, Angel Bill, he's good. Dr. McElfresh's testimony is consistent with Kelsey Kennard. <clears throat> so next, let's talk about the cell phone information that Mr. Sawicki was talking about. Mr. Sawicki, uh, nothing is an analysis inconsistent with Chris Porter. Everything is analysis is inconsistent with what Mr. Segura was telling law enforcement. It appeared as if the purpose of his testimony is to say that Mr. Griffin could have been the killer because he did the, the two different um, sectors there that would have showed where the communication with Mr. Griffin is. But this is another example that you find what you're looking for. Because Mr. Sawicki goes in and he analyzes all these cell phone records from Mr. Griffin in order to show you where it was and that triangulation was, or not the triangulation, excuse me, but what those sectors were, but he never once paid attention to where Mr. Griffin lived. He didn't even know his address. Found what he was looking for. And what was there, once you plug into the fact that Mr. Griffin lives right in the middle of that area, which is almost halfway between this tower and sector and that tower and sector, and you find Andy was on the phone constantly, outgoing, ingoing, outgoing, ingoing, outgoing, ingoing. And what you find is his cell phone records are actually consistent with him sitting in his house using his phone. Again, nothing that links him to Brandy Peter's homicide. Talk about Marquis Davis. Marquise Davis comes in six years later, six years, and says, I saw him at 7.30. Saw a dark colored SUV at 5 way at 8.30. Never told law enforcement because they didn't ask me. They did law enforcement was all over this neighborhood. They blocked this thing out for days. They went back to the scene on multiple different times. They talked to his son, or stepson, excuse me, and his wife, who gave a statement to law enforcement. The law board never asked them. They were in his house. But the law enforcement never asked them. They were possibly confusing these issues. That whenever he came home, he saw the girls were outside playing and eating the Burger King. Whenever Brandy's mom was there in her brown and white SUV. Keep in mind, this is November 19th. It started pretty early back then. It was nighttime. 
Keep in mind, he doesn't even agree with his stepson, who talked about whenever he saw him last. He also didn't even agree with Mr. Segura, who said the kids came home between 6 30 and 7. And also keep in mind, Mr. Segura says, I was there until around 8 30. There wasn't a dark colored SUV there at that time. So Mr. Davis's testimony isn't even consistent with Mr. Segura's testimony. How about Kevin Knox? Kevin Knox's entire duty is to come back here with 21 vision. Hindsight. In hindsight, could TBD have done a couple other things? I don't think there's any question anyway you can say that, including TBD. But does that mean that Mr. Segura didn't do this? Does that mean that Kelsey Kennard and his information that he could only have if Mr. Segura told him is in doubt? Mr. Knox can't even get it right. Mr. Knox comes in and says the phone cord is cut. And he shows this to show his cut because there's no frame. A question on cross-examination. The plug's still in there, and there's our frayed wires. So unless he takes a knife and cuts it right along the wall there, then that's not going to happen. He agreed with me. He missed it. So the shovel was there after the murder because there's no blood spatter. There's none of the purple stuff around it. It's clearly there after the murder. So if you missed the fact that the wig was actually laying on top of the shovel, which would indicate it was there prior to all this happening. Why is the shovel in the living room? I don't know. She got kids. <coughs> kids bring in stuff all the time. Why is the shovel in the living room? I don't know. I don't think anybody does. But what we do know is it was there when Randy was killed. And it wasn't brought by the cartel. He also says Tamaya was shot in the tub or around the tub, somewhere in the same vicinity as a tub, where the body was found. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's not correct either. He completely missed and didn't talk about a vital piece of evidence. This is the couch. This is the blood stain that's on the couch. The DNA says, this to my opinion. We go back and look at our color code in here. The brown is the mixture of the family. You go back and you look at and listen to it. Recall the testimony of Joe Ellen Brown. These items right here, which is the door frame blood, the rug there in the bathroom, as well as that middle cushion, all of those are consistent with Tamaya tonight. As a friend. He completely missed that body piece because it shows that she wasn't killed by the bathtub. Knox is another example of finding what you're looking for. Jack McLean Park, again, we've already talked about this. Um, there was even an issue about the blood from the sink. We all know that turned out to be rust. Law enforcement got that right. Let's talk about Mr. Segura's testimony. Mr. Segura comes in and says, I was at her house for sex. That negates all DNA issues. We know he's there. It negates anything having to do with whether he was there at the scene or not. We know he was there. He admits to being there. But why is he there? After he sits there and tells the law enforcement repeatedly, over and over and over again, I wasn't there, I wasn't there, I wasn't there, I wasn't there. Mr. Segura has got an opportunity to sit here the way the trial and know what the evidence is. Listen to the same testimony that you do. 
he has to explain it. So he has to come in, take a stand, and say, yep, I'll play out his ass. Yet he still says, the reason I did, I lied about it, was because I didn't want to believe that. But you go back and you listen to his interview, or remember his interview, and what he said was, Malika knew about Brandy. She was cool with it. They asked him a further question. Uh, whenever you were there um, at the hospital delivering her, was she there too? He goes, no, nah, she wasn't that cool with it. But Malika knew about Brandy. So that negates his entire reasoning for lying to law enforcement. On top of that, Mr. Prince talks about his heart and the way he is and how good he is, how good a person he is. He can't set aside all that in order to tell law enforcement and help them out with the murders of those two little girls that he helped potty train and live with for a year. That's what they would have you believe. Didn't have a problem telling them about the Wednesday visit. Readily confessed to that. Didn't have a problem telling them about Natasha. Readily confessed to that. The only thing they didn't confess to was the fact that he was telling them I wasn't at the scene of the murder on the day of the murder. He was trying to set up his alibi. Gunfire. 
You don't do that unless you're ready to kill somebody. That is the act of trying to kill somebody. They want to attack the time of death. There's a dog barking. We have no idea what a dog's barking at. Dogs bark at a lot of different stuff. The neighbors, even Mrs. Uh, I forgot her name, but the lady from yesterday, came in and said initially that the neighbors are quick to call the cops. On further questioning, she started backtracking that, oh, those other dogs in the neighborhood. That so they would have called the cops. I will submit to you that's not necessarily true. Um, law enforcement probably called on multiple occasions regarding her dog. That's why she knows that the neighbors are quick to call the cops. But let's talk about this. Sitting around a house at night, there are popping sounds. There are creaking sounds of the house. Jets that are flying over are louder. Sound, sound travels much, much better at night than it would at, say, 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night on a Friday. We've talked about, and you heard from uh, Officer De Bravo and Lewis about how they went into these houses and closed the door and you couldn't hear anything. Um, from the big band that was playing at the Capitol Park, at uh, the uh, stadium that was there. How quiet and insulated these particular houses are. But at night, sound travels a lot more. And you've got three different people going out and talking and worried about this dog barking. Yet not a single one of them heard gunshots. Not a single one of them heard a woman screaming for her life. All they heard was a dog barking. And their attention has been stepped up. They're actually paying attention to what's going on, what's causing the dog to bark. Yeah, they didn't hear gunshots, and they didn't hear the woman screaming for her life. Why? Because the dog was just barking at something. Reasonable doubt is not an imaginary, a speculative, a force, or a possible doubt. And that's what they're asking you to do. Take a look at the rest of the evidence. Ask yourself, are the kids closing consistent with being at 1 o'clock in the morning or 7 to 8 time frame? And first look at tonight. Maybe pajamas, maybe shorts. That one can go either way. Javante, got regular pants on. But the most telling of all of them is Tamaya. Tamaya still has her regular clothes on when she was going to school. Is that consistent with 7 to 8 or 1 o'clock in the morning? That clothing right there is consistent with 7 to 8 at night. Let's go back to the cell phone for one more time. This is the call log that is in evidence that starts on the 13th, one week before the homicide, it's six days before the homicide. And let's take a look at this. And I want you to pay attention to this column right here, which is your time frame. As we scroll through, nine, ten. Look at all of these calls that are being done. And this data right here is the one in which the cell phone is reaching out and actually touching the tower and communicating with the tower. Still on only the 14th.
دے رہا ہوں سر
issues to mind. Two balls on the couch, right there. Brandy hears it, sees it. Her cell phone maybe out in the living room area. Runs in the back trying to get the phone. Anderson Segura walks up to her and knocks it out of the phone. Knocks the earring loose. start shooting. We have one shot that goes in the door here. We actually have another shot that ends up right here where the door of the shower is. And a third shot this way. And a fourth shot out. Mr. Prince would have you believe actually that that's the first shot. And we'll get to that in a second, but it's not. It can't be because it doesn't make sense. But when you go back and you look at these shots, take a look at this trajectory. The angle that's there. It's almost as if the person that is shooting is right there against the wall. And not only that, but that's a downward and a left to right. Let me tell you. the person that's shooting that. I'll tell you. I come up from the right. Going from left to right. Then we've got another shot right here. And then finally this third shot that goes out the doorway into the hall closet. Again, along the left-hand side. And when you triangulate, the only way you make these two shots is if someone's standing right there in the doorway shooting into both of those from the left side. If he's on the right, he can't get that same angle.
what happened is he takes the shots, the first two that go to the bathroom. He shoots at her as she's going away. And we know one of these hit her because she starts bleeding. Maybe not to go ground. This is why he's wrong. Look at the trajectory of that, how high that is. That's not your first shot, because otherwise it's way up here and you're obviously not shooting anybody. This is a struggle that's going on right here. He knocks her down. We're wrestling at this point. Gun goes awry. She manages to get outside, out of the door, brush it against the doorway. She's running down the hallway, dropping blood as she goes. Shoots her again in the back as she's running away. At this point, he's out of ammunition and he's got to reload. She's able to get out the front door, but he grabs her and pulls her back in and beats her down. After he's reloaded the gun, he obviously shot her again and again and again. But then we have Tanaya Peters and the Bontes girl. What have you done with them? In 20 seconds. Each. And we know that he only used one hand, so either he had to uh, drown both of them by pulling them using one to keep the other under, or drown them one at a time. And we know that because on the back of the tub is a long piece of Mrs. Peter's blood and DNA. Put his hand up there. But then there's still Tamaya Peters. Ladies and gentlemen, one time final act of love, actually. In a weird, twisted way. He picks her up, carries her in the couch, brushes her head against the doorway. That is not the act of a Mexican cartel or somebody that does not care about those kids. It's a group. That's the act of a sister. Not done, he's got to go get the cell phone, leave that back door, walk back to his car, starts deleting and covering up the house.
You're not to communicate with any person outside the jury about this case. Until you have reached a verdict, you must not talk about this case in person or through the telephone, writing, or electronic communication, such as a blog, Twitter, email, text message, or any other means. Do not contact anyone to assist you during deliberations. These communication rules apply until I discharge you at the end of the case. If you become aware of any violation of these instructions or any other instruction I have given in this case, you must tell me by giving a note to the bailiff. Many of you have cell phones, tablets, laptops, or other electronic devices. The rules do not allow you to bring your phones, any of those types of electronic devices, into the jury room. Uh, the bailiff will collect those from you before you start your deliberations. If you need to communicate with me, send a note through the bailiff signed by the poor person. If you have voted, do not disclose the actual vote in the note. If you have questions, I will talk with the attorneys before I answer, so it may take some time. You may continue your deliberations while you wait for my answer. I will answer any questions if I can in writing or orally here in the open court. During the trial, items were received into evidence as exhibits. You may examine whatever exhibits you think will help you in your deliberations. These exhibits will be sent into the jury room with you when you begin to deliberate. In closing, let me remind you that it is important that you follow the law spelled out in these instructions in deciding your verdict. There are no other laws that apply to this case. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. For two centuries, we've lived by the Constitution and the law. No juror has the right to violate rules we all share. Yes, I marked it.
uh, will communicate with you. You certainly there's going to be in the media the verdict is returned, and I don't want you to read the substance of what's happening, but you can see what verdict it is. Uh, if it's not a first degree murder conviction, then you'll be through. Uh, if there is a first degree murder conviction, we need to back here Thursday morning. Um, as I say, you leave us a number and we'll communicate with you, but I kind of want to let you know uh, what's expected. And again, please don't, you know, other than, you know, let's say you can see the verdict, but let's not review any media accounts or discuss the case with anyone so you still could be available to us as a witness. Um, I know it's kind of tough to have sat through all this and then you don't get to participate at, at this stage. Um, but, you know, it is a necessary part that we have offense and so we don't have to start all over again. Uh, we do appreciate you being with us. Um, if y'all, it's a little awkward in this, this uh, courtroom, but I can't let you go back in the jury room, but the bailiff will retrieve for you any personal effects. You either you have personal effects back there. Still, as soon as he gets through settling the jury down there, he'll be back in here and, and get your phone number and, get, and retrieve any personal effects uh, for you. Can you let them step out in the, this hallway and let Jimmy know where they are? Uh, okay, we'll stay in session here for the moment. All right, why don't y'all step out with the deputy here and just leave your notes and stuff where they are. We'll take care of them. If we don't see you again, we, just, we do appreciate you being here. If not, we'll see you Thursday morning. All right, thank you.